Hello, my name is Charles Hopkins, and I, I want to thank the organizers for inviting me to be part of your day. I'm very happy, actually, to speak to you as I've been a teacher in outdoor education, as we called it, and environmental education in my past. And I, I taught elementary and secondary school students, both in nature and in a natural setting and in the built environment in downtown Toronto as part of an urban studies program. But today, I also want to talk to you about how important learning beyond the classroom is in a part of BNE and a big in the bigger picture of uh, creating a more sustainable future. So let me put my uh, my slides up and uh, and carry on now. Like Professor Daniel Fisher yesterday, who spoke to you, I uh, I also hold a UNESCO chair in BNE. I'm at York University in Toronto, in Canada, and my chair is on reorienting education towards sustainability. Um, I'm recording this, however, and I hope to speak to you. And when I do, uh, for the question period. Uh, I'll be in Kuala Lumpur in, in Malaysia. But at any rate, let me carry on. Uh, we do have huge challenges in the world regarding sustainability. Although we have now crossed the 8 billion mark in population, we're still expecting have, uh, to reach 10 billion. And in doing that, we have to... Uh, think of how we are going to address the huge social issues of poverty, of exclusion, of uh, the environmental issues that are around uh, the idea of climate change, biodiversity loss, and so on. And of course, the economic issues of uh, how can uh, we address uh, poverty for sure, and and, and people having uh, some kind of equitable access to a reasonable life. So these are, are some of the challenges that are out there. They're out now, but our students are going to be entering into the world sort of 10 years from now on their own and, and on well beyond that. So what I like to do in planning our education programs, is I, one of the things that I look into is the World Economic Forum. The World Economic Forum each year produces a list of what they think are the threats to the future. The current one, if you look on the left side, uh, two years out, the big one is the cost of living crisis and the increases in petroleum, increase in food, rent, shortages of housing and so on, is leading to the overthrow of governments around the world as populist leaders are moving forward. The second one, of course, is natural disasters, and we're experiencing this all around the world. But if when our students enter into the world to live on their own, it'll be 10 years out. And if we look at what are the issues now, they're all green or environmental, the red being the uh, social and political. So the, the idea that 10 years out, our failure of our generation to try and reduce the impact of climate change and our failure to adapt to climate change. These are the big things that will be out there, as well as the natural disasters and the collapse of ecosystems and biodiversity. So how do we begin to, uh, to deal with that? The the huge challenge then, if we pull them all together, it's how can we work together to create social, economic, and environmental systems that ensure both the ability of humans to thrive, but also the planet to survive, 
right? This, uh, these are the huge challenges. And of course, the way in which we are currently trying to do that, and we've been trying since the 1980s, is to look at the world leaders and countries trying to, to move forward in a sense of sustainable development. Now, this came because of the clash in, in the 1970s of some of the well-developed countries wanting to have environmental protection. But at the same time, this roughly 20% of the world's population, they were living all right. But 80% of the world's population was living in poverty and hunger, and they needed development. And so the great um, the, the great negotiations led to this concept of development, yes, for everyone, but development of a certain kind, development that could go on generation after generation without trashing the planet. So the definition of sustainable development that the UN agreed on is development that meets the needs of the present generation without limiting the ability of future generations to do as well. Now, kind of a long definition. I like a much shorter one. It came from an indigenous elder in, uh, in Africa. And he said it's simply enough for all forever. Enough for all forever. Now, what is enough? It is the beautiful discussion you can have with people of all ages, isn't it? And what does for all mean? Being an indigenous person, he was not limiting the enough to humans. It was for all life. And then the intergenerational, forever. Now, in the North, um, the idea of enough kind of sounds like things, material things, right? And so I like the idea of well-being. But again, for all, not just humans, and for all and forever. Now, education has always played a role in shaping the future of the planet. Right. In fact, at the end of the Second World War, when the United Nations was formed, one of the very first institutions that was formed was UNESCO, the United Nations Education, Scientific and Cultural Organization. Because as they said, in the war is created in the minds of men, peace and the future must be created also in the minds of men. And so when in 1987, they were working on the, they came up with the idea of sustainable development. It was encased in a book called Our Common Future. But when the UN agreed upon the concept, they had to come up with an implementation plan. How are we going to do it? And so for the next five years, for five years, world leaders and the people from governments negotiated with one another as to build an implementation plan. And a crucial part of that implementation plan was a whole chapter on the role of education, building public awareness, and training programs. So that Agenda 21, the agenda for the 21st century, had education in it. Now, the, that was the first implementation plan, Agenda 21, and it ran from 1992 to 2000. In 2000, we created the second implementation plan, and it was called the Millennium Development Goals. It had eight uh, uh, objectives in it, one of them again, was education. But as we, it was just limited to mainly the poor, the developing countries. 
And we realized that the real problems were often the most developed countries who were creating the deepest ecological footprints. And so in, 19, in 2012, we started to consult all around the world, around the world we want, right? The world we want. And finally, in 2015, we started the third implementation plan. It's called the 2030 Agenda because it runs from 2015 to 2030. And once again, I think you all are aware of it. Uh, I don't think anyone in Germany who has not seen the colorful, the 17 sustainable development goals. Now, one of them is on education. And if you look on, uh, you'll see SDG 4, Sustainable Development Goal 4. It really focuses on largely on equitable access to quality education. But the part <clears throat> that I want to talk more about today is the last one, 4.7, knowledge and skills for sustainable development. Because I believe, and most people believe, we cannot do that without actual engagement and being in the environment, okay? So the, we're trying to think of what would be the roles of education in building a more sustainable future. And I was part of the writers back in the late 1980s of Agenda 21. They were on the part on education alone, but there were about 12 of us from around the world and one of the, the first things that came forward was the president of an American university who said, we just need better recycling. If we were really good at recycling, we would be forward. But the dean of the University of Cairo and the, the dean of the faculty of education of the university there in Egypt said, I have several hundred thousand children who are very good at recycling. They live in the dumps of Cairo. They spend all day picking through the garbage. He said, they need an education. And so that changed the whole thinking about what education or BNE really should be. And so the first part that we said was access and retention in quality education. Without an educated public, there is no development, right? But the second thing was realizing, again, it's our most educated countries that are creating some of the most difficult problems. And so what we needed to do, we decided, was to reorient or um, just, yeah, repurpose education towards sustainability, to move the, the, the uh, transformation of education from focusing on development and economic growth to development, yes, but sustainable development. And then, of course, the third thing was we had to have parents and we had to have the general public knowledgeable, on board, and supportive. Right? Governments will not move in that direction if they do not have the support of the general public. They are afraid of being tossed out of office. And the same with corporations and the private sector. Right? They are not going to build sustainable products if the general public, the consumers, don't buy it. And then the fourth thing is training, where we do know how to do things better, cleaner, simpler, using less energy, less natural resources, and so on. 
those kinds of training programs are also extremely important. Now, the thing was, though, how do we bring BNE in, into the education system? I think if you look at, at this list, at, at, after I was an outdoor educator, I went up into administration and I was the superintendent of curriculum for the Toronto Board of Education. Every week, a group of parents would come in with a, 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 a file folder and they'd say, this is really important. Please put it in the curriculum. Now, of course, the curriculum is full. And so we did not want to create something called sustainability education. I don't know how this translates in, into German, but we refer to them as adjectival educations. Because before the word education, you have an adjective. Peace education, environment education, uh, drug education, uh, sexual education, on and on. So what we wanted to do was to simply build uh, sustainability in as a purpose of all levels of education and, and pretty well all disciplines. Now what is happening is there is a call for transforming education. Because although we've been trying to use education since 1992, we are still not moving far enough and fast enough. And education around the world, all levels of education have a huge problem. At the moment, post COVID, we have almost 250 million children for whom there is no school in the world. We have another 770 million for whom they've been in school for five or six years, but still do not have literacy, they can't read, and their mathematic skills are terribly poor. We're short almost 70 million teachers to deliver programs for all, all the students. And of course, only about 10% of learning is really online. So we have a huge problem uh, uh, around the, the digital. But trying to transform, the big question is, are we transforming how we deliver education? Right? Or is the goal really to transform the learners so that they in turn will transform society as they, as they grow up? Because we realize that our current path of how the world is developing is not sustainable. So there is confusion and so on around the, uh, the idea of transforming. Now, teachers themselves in surveys are saying that they are not really up to speed on how do we, how to transform, how to address the big issues of climate change, sustainable production and consumption, uh, social justice issues, human rights, racism, uh, cultural diversity, tolerance. These are huge issues that can destroy communities and ruin the lives of many people. So these are the kinds of things that we need to do. And this is where we must reach out beyond schools. We must reach out into the community and form partnerships. And, and I'll, come, uh, I'll come back to that. Now, for teachers to feel sort of comfortable, we've come up with what we call a strengths model. We're not asking all teachers to teach everything, but we're asking them to begin, to start with whatever it is that they are very, very good at. Because no one discipline, it's not environmental science that can do it all. 
right? It, it, it's not history or geography that can do it all. We do need to have some of those adjectival educations because the core disciplines of history, geography, science, mathematics, and so on, they are not sufficient. They, they are not preparing people for the world of 2030, 2040. So in this, what we call a strength model, no one discipline can do it all, but every discipline can contribute. This is important. So once every discipline can get going, the second, uh, third thing rather, is that we have to bring them together in a kind of coherent pattern, a program, so that we discuss when students are going to go where, what they're going to, to uh, have in their curriculum, that's appropriate and so on, who we can bring in from the outside to work with our, with our students. Then the next thing is that the administration, when things are working, they need to resource it. They need to provide the materials, the, the teachers and, and the funding for this. And lastly, where it really is working, we need to put this into policy so that the next leader doesn't come and say, oh, well, that was then, this is now, we're going. We need this to build into a coherent, meaningful program over time. Now, when I say the strengths, it doesn't matter whether it's a language arts teacher, a history teacher who can talk about power, a language arts teacher that um, helps people uh, to detect fake material, how do you learn online, and so on. Uh, let me use the example of mathematics, because oftentimes mathematics people say, well, this isn't anything to do with me. If we work with, with a combination of mathematics, science, and so on, uh, I know water was part of your theme, so I put this together the 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 amount of of uh, of water somehow when we start talking about billions and trillions of liters it becomes a very um, uh, very confusing we can't really say it. so one way of looking at it in the diagram if you were to take all the water in the oceans and the ice caps everything and put it into one ball. You can see in the picture, the, there are actually two balls. You have to look very closely. The bigger blue ball is the oceans. And the tiny little blue ball beside it, that's the world's fresh water. Now that's, that's one way of looking at it. But once you get over in the classroom, we can talk about all of the facts, the figures, and so on. But we need to build a feeling of concern, right, for the whole thing. So once again, they can look at a picture and, and sort of put it into perspective. What I like doing is taking the students outside. <clears throat> take them onto a soccer pitch or something that is close to 100 meters long, because then you can use percentage, because 97.2% of all the water on our earth is salt water from the ocean. So we don't give them the figures perhaps at the very beginning, but you ask them to say, we're going to line up at one end of the field and we're going to walk down the field where we think this is where the salt water ends. And so they start, and after about 20, 30 meters, they, they start looking around for who they think is the smartest child in the class and, and line up with them, et cetera. But when you take them all the way down, 
past the 97 yards, then they suddenly feel it. You know, they're, they've walked it. They're looking to the anticipation all the way down. And then in the remaining, those remaining less than three meters, you have the Antarctic ice, which is another 1.9 meter. And when you get down to all of the water in all of the rivers of the world, the distance to the end of that soccer pitch is the thickness of a human hair. That's it. So you can see the, the ways of the learning, the feeling, the emotion and so on is just so, so much deeper than simply looking at a chart in a classroom. Right? We need you. We need everyone to learn wherever we possibly can. So the, the meaningful of, of engagement with the community is extremely important. In the top picture on the left, this is a picture I took in India of young high school students, each one learning about a particular herb that had uh, medicinal purposes. And they were learning this and mixing a few, but they were then going out into the poor rural community to almost act like doctors with, with their one cure finding people that needed it, and showing the people in that village how to, how to grow it. In a more northern context, what is meaningful to young people? I under, uh, understand that many of them, bicycling, right? And so teaching them not only in listening to their protests and so on, but building their skills of how to pull together in language arts, how to pull together a presentation, visual presentation, the right wording. How do we know what the politicians, uh, what is their, their real interest and trigger? And so the knowledge and skills to how to, to bring about change is extremely important. So finding meaningful ways of, uh, of actually engaging. Because this kind of political action and so on is how we think we will be able to transform the learning process. UNESCO is recommending a, a number of steps. Now, the first one is getting accurate information, and that can be done in the classroom and, and, and so on. They become aware. They, now, they may get additional data by going out into the community and interviewing people and so on, but getting that. And then them thinking, using critical analysis, discussions of what could be done, what should be done, so on. And then going out, and this is again where it's so important, we know the more senses that are involved, the greater and the deeper the learning experience will be. Right? So sense, smell, emotions, engagement, touching, feel, even if it's pouring rain, they will remember that particular day. So the experiential exposure, the talking with homeless people, the talking with, with migrants of what their life was like, why, or, and so on, that is really important. And together, that knowledge, the critical thinking about it, and the engagement, we hope, will build compassion. You know, so that they will wish to not only be aware and know about it for a test, but they will actually become engaged and do something. And so it's that knowledgeable, compassionate mind that is willing to engage 
That really is what we are looking for. Now, there is, we can't do it with everything. Uh, and when we look at the sustainable development goals, you know, hunger, poverty, uh, poverty health, gender, these are, are big ideas, but really they come from five areas. These are the ones that will be within the next implementation plan from 2030 to 2045, perhaps, which would be the anniversary, the 100 years of the United Nations, or maybe 2050, that has a nice sound to it. But at any rate, the big five big issues, it's about people, about society. Yeah. It's about human. In it's also about the prosperity. Okay. It, it, and the prosperity, not just for some, but equitable prosperity so that people have enough to live on reasonably comfortable. Right. But it is also, remember, about not trashing the planet. And so the environment is called planet. And how do we balance these things? We also know that the huge goal is one of peace. Peace not only between countries, but within countries. It is about peace in our communities. It's about inner peace. It's about people within themselves, right? And the only way we're going to do it, it's not just about governments negotiating with one another around climate change and so on. No, it's about partnerships. Everyone needs to be engaged, everyone contributing and doing something along that line. So what we need to do is to take the idea of balancing people, planet, prosperity, partnership in a peaceful way, taking the con the, those concepts and then bringing them down to the local level. And this again is where we need everyone in the community who engages with youth and helps to deliver the program in reality. We need to, the, the environmental, the, you know, the planet, right? We need to look at how does how does that appear in the local condition, right? and the same with people with the social justice, equity, gender, and so on, and the economic issues that are in your in your own community. But engaging in all of these, how to go from global to local to personal. Right? How do we do this in a meaningful way? Those are the challenges. And you can see that those of us who teach beyond the classroom are crucial in this, uh, in this larger step. Because the other issue is back in the school and on the school grounds itself. I want to tell you a, a little story. I had the pleasure of meeting Mahatma Gandhi's nephew. And his nephew told me that he loved Gandhi. And Gandhi had time for him. Even in meetings, Gandhi would stop and speak to him if, if his little nephew walked in. He was a very kind man. But the nephew loved candy. He would find candy and he would just devour it. And his mother would hide it. He'd find it. And so his mother was concerned that he was uh, he'd perhaps get diabetes. So, and she knew that Gandhi and the nephew loved one another, really liked one another. And so she went to Gandhi and she said, Please, please ask him to stop eating candy. And Gandhi looked at her and said, Okay, in three months, 
I will ask him to stop eating candy. And of course, she looked at him and said, in three months, no, no, we need you now. And Gandhi said, for it to be real that I ask him to stop eating candy, first, I must stop eating candy, right? And <clears throat> so I, I take that, if our schools are going to ask people, ask their students to live in a certain way and so on, the schools themselves should portray it, right? The schools themselves should be models of what they, what they are asking them to do. And so we need to, if we want them, the young people to be citizens and be active citizens, then they must practice citizenship. Simply on the day you graduate, if you've never practiced anything in the way of citizenship, you, you don't turn in to a knowledgeable citizen. So our schools must do this. And then not only within the school, but we need to start thinking about the whole community, the whole system of the community, having our students explore, to learn about it, and to care about it. And usually one of the first steps of caring about something is knowing about it, experiencing it meeting it, learning about it, right? Because then you start to think of it as almost something of who you are. And so in summing up, I want to, to say, first of all, on, on the left, the idea of leadership. Traditionally, we started there in the bottom where you have um, the school uh, principal or vice principal, and he relates to some of the staff. And there are some leaders in the staff. I know as we, as a teacher, we know the influential teachers and so on. And so we need, though, to move on because we really don't have a clear vision of where we're going. I hope this translates, but I use the analogy that it's like driving the sustainability bus by looking up in the rear view mirror. We know what we want to drive away from clearer than where we are going in the future. So this takes a very different kind of leadership. This takes people of good heart who are trying to both move away from the things we need to stop doing. What are the things that we're doing well? And what are the things we need to start? Where should we be going? And this has to be a collegial discussion with everyone. That's sort of within the school, the whole leadership model. We're all leaders when we think is when we have our group of students. And we must teach leadership and followership in our classes. The other one is our relationship. I look at the community as the yellow dot. Right. When we start, we have, especially in universities, we have the different disciplines all on their own. And maybe one of them will reach out into the community and, and work with them or try to learn from them. But in the next phase, as you go up, the community reaches around and is engaged in uh, several of the departments and, and, and right. until finally the community is an integral part of the curriculum of the school. So the teachers know where other teachers are going, what they're visiting, who they're bringing in as speakers and so on. And they design a integrated 
comprehensive program for for their uh, for their students. So all of this together can become sort of a a lighthouse of transforming education towards a more sustainable future. Now, and lastly, I ask the need to hurry. The need to hurry. We time is running out. We use the idea of the tree of life. And there are so it is so complex, so many things that that need to be addressed and urge people to start talking, collaborate, working with one another, different NGOs working with other NGOs who could be who could work uh, together in in synergy, right? Because there's so little money for this often non-government organizations, community organizations are almost rivals trying to get the school groups. And the school groups have raising the, the funds and so on to, to be able to, to be engaged in the natural environment. But everyone can do something. Now, embedded in that circle of the sustainable development goals is one more last story. Almost 20 years ago in India, in the city of Hyderabad, in a grade four class, a teacher was teaching about ecological footprints, the impact we make on the planet just by living our lives, the, the impact of creating an automobile, you know, all, all of this, our, our impact. And this little girl said, but I have hands. I can do something about my footprint. And the teacher recognized the idea of the negativity of the footprint and the positive handprint. And so she had the children, you know, with paint and they did it all over the wall, but she didn't stop there. She went to a community group, the Center for Environmental Education in, in uh, Ahmedabad in India. She went there and they realized the beauty of this simple idea from this little girl. And they started writing curriculum and a program and they took it to the Ministry of Environment in India and the program grew, the program spread throughout India, out into Asia, Africa, and is spreading around the world because it is hopeful and we need hope. You know? And we're going to need hope even more because in the near future, until we actually can transform things, we're going to experience huge environmental problems, and huge social problems. And we will in involve economic problems. And they're all intertwined in into, into issues. As the, the weather pattern changed in sub-Saharan Africa, the drought led to mass migration north, people starving to the shores of the Mediterranean. And you know, as what better than I in Canada, that the forced migration into Europe has, on the one hand, led to access to cheap labor, but it has also led to social upheaval. Not the problem. They've, it wasn't the people in sub Saharan Africa that has created climate change. These are complex issues, but we need to start thinking about them. We need to start addressing these because is that what started out as an environmental issue is now an economic and social justice issue in other parts of the world. It is the same thing is happening in Central America as from 
nine years of drought, people forcing and trying to come up into the United States. So at any rate, I, uh, I want to uh, close this presentation and hopefully I will be with you live for a, a question and discussion period uh, following this. Thank you very much for your attention, and I look forward to discussing things with you. Goodbye.